Okay, how's everyone doing? Welcome, EE two twenty five E. A lot of lectures. Woohoo! We're like what mid semester? I think. Is that amazing? Do you think you know more about MR than you did? Okay, some of you, some of you. That's kind of encouraging, I guess. Um, again, thanks, uh, thanks again for everybody is putting their uh, photo. I appreciate that. It's always nice to um, to look at people's reaction to um, the outrageous thing I say. Um, the other, um, the other thing is, uh, thank you. Uh, the rest of you also appreciate coming to class. Um, it's nice, nice that. Um, to see so many people taking it. Okay, exciting, uh, exciting material uh, we're covering. Um, today we're going to continue on with chapter six, uh, RF excitation. Hope you are as excited as I am uh, to cover this. Um, just a quick, uh, a quick thing about previous. Previously, we talked about non-selective excitation. And with non-selective excitation, things were very, very simple. As long as you apply the RF on um, in the same, um, I guess, axis in the, um, in the rotating frame, then, uh, then everything that you get is just the, the addition. So you just get rotation, rotations, rotations. And it's rotation that adds around a single axis. So that was, that was very nice. Um, so as long as we don't have gradients on, then we're good. Um, by the way, there's one place in the scanner where we could always analyze what the RF is no matter what, very easily. Any idea which place in the scanner that's true? And if you think that you're uh, unmuted, but you are, then just unmute the button and then press, and then say exactly what you wanted to say again. Isocenter. Yeah, isocenter. Like why? why? Why isocenter is easier to analyze? Gradients are all zero. Yeah, the contribution of the gradients at the center of the scanner is zero because the, the field in homogeneity that the gradients create is G dot R, or GX times X plus GY times Y plus GZ plus Z, uh, all that in the Z direction, right? So when Z equals zero, X equals zero, and Y equals zero, that also means that the contribution of the gradients at that, those points are also zero. And so one thing to remember is that if I give you an RF pulse in the presence of a gradient, it's very easy to go and see what's going on in the center, um, like in the center position. And that will help you uh, debug whether the answer that you have is makes sense. Because if you have some inconsistency with what you actually came up with and this result, uh, then, uh, then something's off. off. So 
Um, so this is one, 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 one test that you could actually go. Okay, so now I wanna talk about a select uh, topic, uh, which is a uh, slice selective example. And in this case, we have, let's say something like this, like the following pulse sequence where we have some RF, uh, let's say a sync pulse or some other pulse. And uh, we have that in the presence of a gradient. So the gradient is on during that time. And then I said, oh, this is slice selection and the gradient is on while the RF. And then there's this mysterious, um, you know, negative lobe that has the same area as this one. We didn't say what it is, but I did say that's necessary in order to receive a signal. Okay. Uh, it's not necessarily necessary for excitation, but it's necessary for receiving a signal. Isn't that strange, huh? I don't know. I mean, like, so strange. Why do you need this cute baby, you know, baby block um, after this, this, this thing? So mysterious. Anyway, so the what we would like to analyze is we'd like to analyze what is MXY as a function of position at this time point. Hopefully MXY at the function of uh, position would look like, you know, only spins excited in a certain region and then nothing else excited outside of that region, right? So this is this is slice selection. We would like pro probably if this is um, if this is z, we would like to see you know something like that, where this is z equals zero. Okay, something like that where um, oh, and this is the magnitude of m x y. So this is something that we would like to see, right? We'd like to see some something like that. That means that we are exciting a select number of spins, you know, like just in the center of you know uh, of a slice, but not anywhere else. And in order to analyze kind of what's going on, remember that when the gradient is on, that means that on the far side of the scanner, in let's say in the z direction, the frequency is going to be higher than uh, the center. And on the other side, the frequency is going to be lower than the center. And there is a linearly, linear distribution of those uh, frequencies as we move up in the Z and move in the Z direction. So if you remember, um, when, um, when actually the gradient is applied, well, then that is, then the um, applied field is both the gradient and the RF. So we can or not ignore the gradient anymore. Okay. All right. And so just to kind of try to again hand wave what is going on, um, let's actually uh, let's actually see what uh, what what is actually going on. Um, so we said that in the center, um, the center gz times z equals zero. So here we should have a perfect excitation. You know the spins should just go and be excited. No problem whatsoever. Um, you know, as long as the as long as the RF is on, then the magnetization will process about the RF, and it will just go like this and be you know uh, moving the uh, zy plane. Now, what about where uh, gz times z um, is? You know, uh, we're talking about far away in the z direction, where gz times z is actually much much. Uh, bigger in magnitude than the B1 field. Well, in that case, the B1 field, you know, is still the same, but the uh, GZ times Z, it's really, really strong component. It's so strong, you can't even see the arrow. I mean, I could have probably, you know, did something like this and then kept on going maybe a few, uh, a few meters down and saying, oh, you know what? This is GZ times Z, you know? So this component is very, very strong. That means that spins far away in the Z uh, direction will process uh, about the Z axis because that's really, you know, the applied field. Uh, what, it, what is the direction of the applied field? Well, it's really just dominated by the gradient. And so really the magnetization will process 
about that field. So it's just stay and in its place. You kind of see it's wobbling around, but it's not really being excited. Yeah? Okay. Now, as we move closer to, uh, to z equals zero, so we get to the place where the size, um, the size of the uh, magnitude of the applied B1 field and the applied gradient field are the same magnitude. In that case, the gradient, uh, the applied field is gonna be at 45 degree. And so our magnetization is going to process around this. So there, are, there is going to be some excitation, though that excitation is going to be partial. Okay, it's not going to, for example, to cross the uh, the uh, the z equals zero plane. Okay, in this case, so the excitation is going to be partial. Um, I mentioned what happening at g z equals zero. The excitation is complete, and then exactly on the other side, we have excitation that it's partial again, and then far away, ten centimeter away, for example, then again, g z times z is much much bigger than b one. Hence, the magnetization is just going to process again about, um, um, about the z-axis and not be excited. So we have far away, not excited, in the center, full excitation, and then close to the center, close to that, there is partial excitation. But the question is like, you know, what is partial and how much is partial and so on and so forth? You know, that's not clear. And you know, how far away from z you're starting to get close to zero? That's another question. So that's what we're going to analyze. But at least I, I want you to understand kind of like the, the thousand feet view is that far away, no excitation. And then as you get close, there is some excitation. And definitely on resonance, there is, uh, or not like on resonance or at the center of the magnet, there is full excitation. Only questions up to here before we go and analyze the whole thing. Question? Yes. So, uh, what does the ray arrow represent here? The red arrow is the magnetization vector. So what, what's happening to it after it's being, uh, you know, after the applied field is being applied to it, it's going to start processing, right? So, so green arrow is the gradient, yellow arrow, yellow arrow is the RF, and the red arrow is the magnetization. I see. So is it in the rotating? Uh, I'm assuming it's in the rotating. This is all, all in the rotating frame, right? Because there's no B zero. Right. Otherwise, otherwise it would behave uh, like this one in the center of the magnet would not just rotate like uh, like you know like this. Right. It will not rotate like this. It would it would go like in a spiral in the lab frame. Right. Okay. Any more questions? Sounds good. Okay. So the simple case is on resonance, g z equals zero. So then uh, the flip angle adds, angles add. Then the uh, angle that we're going to be exciting is going to be gamma, the integral of zero to tau of b one tau uh, b one of t dt. Okay. So that is going to be um, you know the flip angle at on resonance, basically g at, at z equals zero. Far off resonance, we said that the um, that the applied field is pretty much normal. So it's like a pointing in the z direction pretty much. Hence, no MXY is going to be produced. And so the question is kind of what's going to happen in the you know, transition region, OK? So again, if we're talking about, and by the way, I'm talking in the z direction, but it's also frequency, right? When you, when you apply a gradient, you know, position also corresponds to frequency. So I'm going to interchange those. That's why I'm saying that the center of the scanner is is is, uh, is on resonance, and outside of the center is not on resonance because you're applying a gradient field. Okay. All right. So in general, it's a hard problem because fundamentally rotations are nonlinear, um, and also they don't commute. So if I apply one rotation, you know, it doesn't commute with another one necessarily, um, if they're not applied on the same axis. If they're applied on the same axis, then they commute and they, they're linear uh, and they add. But if they're not on the same axis, then they're not. And so there's, there's pretty much a lot of solution for many special cases, including some of the most interesting ones. 
And what we're going to do now is we're going to try to analyze, you know, what is really the shape of the uh, magnetization after we apply an RF pulse in the presence of the gradient, but we're going to make some approximations in order to do, uh, to do this analysis. Okay. That would then lead us, if we know how to do the analysis, then we can also do a design, right? Where we can go back and uh, design RF pulses. And what we're going to first assume is very similar thing to what people do uh, when they uh, do an analysis of a pendulum. They do what's called a, a small tip angle excitation. So basically, um, basically the idea is the following. Um, we're going to assume that the flip angle that we're going to apply is going to be small. In that case, uh, we're going to assume that cosine theta times M0, which is the MZ component, is not going to change. So cosine theta for small angle equals one. Hence, uh, we're going to assume that MZ stays M0 for the entire uh, pulse. Is that a valid assumption? Nah. Yeah, for small flip angle. But of course, for large flip angle, it's not going to be a valid assumption. And we're also going to assume that mxy is sine theta times m0, but for small angles, sine theta is actually theta times m0. Okay, so uh, this is a very simple assumption. So if we look at the uh, block equation um, in general uh, for excitation, you know, we, we're going to again we said we're ignoring relaxation because the RF pulses are short, so we don't need to present them. Um, but once, so we have uh, both the B1 field and the gradient field are on, but we also said that MZ doesn't change. If MZ doesn't change, then this entire row has to be zero. Okay. Because this entire row, um, basically governs what is the change in MZ. And we said the change in MZ is zero. Hence this, this has to be zero. All right, so now uh, what we have is that we have mx dot, my dot, mz dot equals to these, this two by three matrix multiplied by mx, my, mz. Okay, that's our linear dynamic system. And basically I'm gonna write it this way. Okay, this is how it's, how it's written. Um, now m0 is a constant, right? It's not a variable. So the way this is written is not written in the nice format of a linear dynamic system. Usually linear dynamic system will have something that, you know, some matrix and then here the, the, uh, the variables plus some, you know, constant input or something like that. So we can massage this to actually uh, look like this, right? So this is completely equivalent uh, where MX dot, MY dot equals to zero minus uh, gamma g dot r, gamma g dot r, zero times mx and, and y, plus, um, you know, the b1 field multiplied by m0, right? Because uh, it's really the third row is multiplied by m0. This is a constant. Hence, we can just write it this way. Okay. Yes. Okay. So in this case, the dynamic is going to be precession, right? If, if there is no B1 field, then there's just precession about the gradients. Right? This is a rotate, this results in a rotation. So if this is off, if the grid, if the if the B1 field is off, then our magnetization is just going to rotate um, in the XY plane. That's what it's going to do. Just rotate in the transverse plane. Okay. Very similar to reception. Um, when there is excitation, well, then there's input to the system. There is actually energy being generated. And so, you know, magnetization, magnetization is being generated once you apply a B1 field. Okay, it's been added to the system, okay, as an input. Now, you have to understand that, of course, MX and Y are a function of time, but also G and B are a function of time, right? So G and B are a function of time. Now, usually in linear dynamic systems, you know, uh, this will be constant, this will be constant, 
And this would change over time, right? Like the input would change. So this is, we form, we pose this as a linear dynamic system, but again, the input, uh, like the, the, what we can actually control is actually B1 and G, which is from an analysis point of view is much more difficult than what you've seen, let's say in 16B. Uh, because the, the control is not on M0, the control is actually on B1, X and Y and, and the Gs. Okay, so, you know, solving for the inputs or, you know, that is a little bit more difficult. Okay, so let's see what's going on. This is very similar to procession, right? Like it's just the, to the reception part, okay? So, um, and I mentioned that there's really this nice duality between the reception and excitation that we're gonna go over right now. So effectively, now we can solve this, right? We can solve this linear dynamic equation and see what the result would be. For some given G and some given Bs, you know, we can solve this, okay? And for example, again, at isocenter, at isocenter, B1 is equal to B1X, let's say, just applying in the X direction. In that case, uh, there's, no, there's no rotation, there's no precession. So our system at isocenter is mx dot and my dot equals zero gamma b1x times m0. And the solution for this is very simple, right? Uh, what I can do is I can take this equation and I can do plus j times this equation, right? And again, represent the mxy component as a complex number, right? In that case, mxy equals mx plus i and y. Um, and the result will be linear with B1. So mxy will be equal to I gamma B1x M0 times T. Okay, so uh, effectively mxy will just increment with T. Isn't that great? Uh, is that realistic by the way? Like it's true for a small flip angle, of course, uh, this equation also shows that the magnetization grows to infinity as T goes to infinity, which doesn't make sense, right? So remember that it has to only be true for small flip angles. Okay. So the magnetization will grow linearly uh, as a function of uh, B1, but you have to realize that this is not the case uh, for, uh, you know, for large flip angles. It doesn't grow linearly anymore. It actually grows with a sign of theta. Any questions here? Now we're gonna go and solve, you know, for the non-isocenter case. Okay, this is the case for the non-isocenter. So I can do again the same trick that I've done before. I can take the first equation plus J or I times the second equation, right? Um, now, you know, I can go through this entire math again, but to be honest, I don't want to. Uh, it comes very similar. It comes. It, it comes down to be very similar uh, to uh, the whole idea is again. You want to kind of massage it to look like m x plus i m y, and then b one x plus i b one y. Like that's what you want to massage it to. Okay, uh, to look like, um, and then that ends up being uh, something like this. So m x y uh, m x y dot will be equal to minus i gamma g dot r times mxy plus i gamma b1 times m0. That's what it would end up being. Okay, this is not too hard to go through and feel free to go through it um, at home. So this, this, this is our dynamic equation. Uh, mxy dot equals again negative i gamma g dot r times mxy plus i gamma b1 times m0. And we can solve this again in very similar to the reception case where we have an integrating factor of e to the i, integral goes from minus infinity to t, gamma g dot r uh, d tau. Okay, that's our integrating factor. And so uh, we multiply our equation, uh, basically mxy times that, and d, d to dt of this uh, is the same as i gamma b1 uh, t uh, m0 multiplied by that integrating factor. Okay, you can actually show that this, this actually, when you, um, 
um, when you do that, then th that results in the right in the right uh, integration integrating thing. Like we'd like exactly like we did before. Okay, so effectively now we just need to integrate this part. Okay, and then we've got this equals the integral of this part. Okay, this whatever you have in the brackets equals the integral um, of this part from minus infinity all the way to time um, t. And this is exactly um, what we want to do. We want to integrate from minus infinity to t equals capital T to find what is mxy of, uh, of a position. Um, and often case, because we're doing a slice, you know, that will be z, because if we only apply gz, then that will be uh, z. But if we apply, you know, also x and, you know, gx or gy, you know, it could be more complicated. And then we want to evaluate that at time t, which is at the end of the pulse. Okay, time t is in the end of the pulse. Okay, so this looks like this. mxy, you know, all that stuff, multiplying by this uh, complex exponential equals the integral from minus infinity to t of, of this part. Uh, and then multiply by this complex exponential. So now we need to divide by this component. If we divide by this component, then we end up with just mxy, right? We divide both sides by this. We divide by this here and here. Is it okay? Right? So dividing by this means that I need to subtract whatever is in the exponent, okay? So basically I took the whole thing here and because I divide it, I just need to subtract what's in the exponent, okay? So this is what I get. Now, these two are integrating exactly the same thing. Inside the integral, there's gamma g of tau dot r, right, d tau, and this is gamma g of tau dot r d tau. So it's the same thing. The only difference is the integration range. This one goes from minus infinity to t, and this one goes away all the way from minus infinity to a capital T. Okay? So if you think about this, if we look at time from minus infinity all the way to capital T, right? then the first, this integral, integrates a function from this time point all the way to here. This integral integrates the function all the way from minus infinity, all the way to t, okay? So effectively, you take this minus that, that is the same as the integral um, from minus infinity, from, sorry, from t to capital T. Right? If you have integrals to the entire thing and then integral to here, this one is in the negative. So effectively, it's the negative integral from this point all the way to this point. So I can just change this integral to be from, um, you know, uh, from t all the way to, uh, from small t all the way to capital T, and that's it. Does that make sense? Are we okay? Raise your digital hand that I'm okay. All right. So this is exactly what I've done. First of all, it has to have a negative sign because again, this is a negative and that's the biggest part, right? So it has to have a negative sign. So that's why it's negative. And then I integrate from T to uh, small t to capital T. That's it. Okay. All right. So then the question is, is this a Fourier transform? Kind of looks like, but it isn't, right? Like we still have, you know, an integral over here. You know, it doesn't look, what we want to do is we want to have some k, z dot z or kr dot r, you know? Like we want to have like a kr dot r somewhere, you know, in the exponent. And then um, when we integrate, we want to integrate, I don't know, uh, do we want to integrate over t? No, we probably want to integrate over some k as opposed to t, you know, like we did in the reception part. 
So this is B1 of T as opposed to B1 of K. So it's, it's still not a Fourier transform, but it's very close to being one. So we're going to massage this one to look like a Fourier transform, very much like we did in the reception side. OK. So um, the solution uh, for general equation in time t will be mxy at position r at times t is going to be equal to i m0, the integral from minus infinity to capital T, gamma b1 of t. And then if you actually look at what's the integral, I can say, you know what, in the integral here, I can just say k of t equals gamma over 2 pi, the integral from t all the way to capital T of g of tau. And then here, I will have i 2 pi kt dot r. OK? Basically, I define k space to be this equation. Now, this is slightly different. This is different from reception. In reception, the integral was from 0 to capital T, or to, sorry, for 0 to some t. Here is for some t to capital T, to the end as opposed from the start to some time. You see the difference? For the reception, those integral region was from zero all the way to some t. Now, our situation is from t to some constant to the end. OK, so the integral is a little bit different. So our k, of, our k space is a little bit different, but it's still a k space. It doesn't matter. Right, it's some, some k value. Um, and effectively, k of t is proportional to the area of the remaining gradient. Okay, the remaining gradient of the RF pulse. Okay, of that of that situation. The remaining gradient. In the reception case. It was the area from the beginning all the way to our time point of the gradient, right? Here, it's k space is actually the area of what's left, which is interesting. OK? All right. So is this a Fourier transform? Who says yes? Raise your hand, digital hand. Raise your digital hand if you think it's a Fourier transform. Like you can actually put like a hand. It's like uh, it's cool. It's like a, it's a, it's a it's a feature in Zoom. Hold, let me show you. Um, I can go to um, actually I don't know. I don't think I can actually do it. I think anybody else could do it, but I can't. Yeah, because I'm the host. Anyway, doesn't matter. And nobody seems to actually bite. So, um, and, and you're absolutely right. This is not a Fourier transform. Anybody can say why it's not a Fourier transform? Because you're only integrating to big T. So what? So for it to be a Fourier transform, you'd have to have, uh, you had to integrate over um, from negative infinity to positive infinity. Yeah, but we don't have signals after t, time t. Like we don't apply anything, right? So it's like the same as integrating over. Got you. Right? So maybe that's not it. But there is something about what you said, integrating over something. You're integrating over what? You're integrating over the time that you have R in the exponent. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, a Fourier transform should have been like, you know, like K dot, you know, T. I mean, like, you know, like the, the like basically a new T dot R, but it's like, it can't, it can't be like, you know, K R and like when we integrate over T, you know, it's like, no, it doesn't work. We need to integrate over k. So we need to change our integral to integrate over k. Then it would be a Fourier transform. Right? An integral over k would be the right thing. 
Now we're integrating over T as opposed to integrating over K. Um, since the, I mean, um, so because K, K is a function of T, couldn't you technically think about, um, I guess you're not integrating that, over that part. But I don't know. It doesn't have to be though a linear function of T. True. Yeah. Right? So if it's a linear function, well, if K was equal T, then that would be fine. Mm -hmm. That would be the same, right? K equal T, then it's fine to integrate over K. But K is not necessarily a function of T. So we could change the variables to integrate over K, but we have to do something about it. Okay, so this is exactly what we're going to do, is we're going to change the integral uh, to be an integral over K. So we're moving from something like this to some W of K, e to the minus I to pi K, and in that case, uh, we're talking about kz, z, but it was, you know, it could be generally, you know, kr and then r, right? So it could be like arbitrary. Uh, but in this case, we're just doing slice selection. So mxy at z and tau equals to that. Uh, but this is again integral over dt. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to change this to be a function of k. Gamma b1 of t, you know, because k is a function of t, t is also a function of k. And so we can basically try to represent the b1, instead of b1 of t, we're going to modify it to some w of k. And the question is, what, what is w of k? Well, w of k is 2 pi b1 uh, of k divided by g of k. Question? Did you, yeah. lose, did you lose your t in the integral from t to t? Here? Yeah, don't. Yeah, you should be little what t. You, you have a zero right here. No, no, no. It's it's uh no, it's capital T, right? The other zero one. to capital T. Oh wait, it was uh oh yeah, I see. It was for t. Some time. No, but that was k. K was from time t, but this was minus infinity to t. Right? Okay. And or, we don't have anything yeah, before zero. But because there isn't anything before, then it's zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we switch to integrate over k. And to integrate over k, we need to basically compensate for some density that we do. And the result is 2 pi b1 of k divided by g of k. Okay. Because we can visit, for example, you know, the same k equals zero, k is equal zero. We can visit many times and apply some B1, right? But when we integrate over K, we need to, uh, you know, sum all those operate, you know, sum all those times, right? So it, we need to change these variables. Change of variables comes down to be basically W of K, two pi B1 of K divided by G of K. Okay, that's the, um, how do you call this? The, when you change variables, uh, the um, Jacobian. I guess ends up being okay. All right. Um, so now this is a Fourier transform. Now this is a Fourier transform, and it's a Fourier transform of W of k. So the question is, how do we compute what is m x y if we know b one and we know g? Right. We know that mxy equal to all that, right? But how do we go and compute? Like we know what b1 is, we know what g is. How do we go and compute what is mxy? Well, what we do is, is first of all, um, we need to find what is the value of b1 as a function of k. And then we also need to uh, figure out what is uh, the gradient as a function of k. Then we can calculate what is W of K. And once we know what is W of K, then we can compute a Fourier transform and then get the result for this. And let me show you now how it works. Okay. So the first thing that we have to do is find what KZ of T is. Then we're going to map B1 of T to KZ of T. Okay. And then we're going to compute the integral over k's. Okay, so here's um, 
here's how it works. Uh oh, what did I do? Yeah. Okay, so let's go over it. So here's what's happening. We apply B1 and we apply the gradient and we want to know what is MXY at this time point after the RF pulse. So what we need to do first is to compute KZ as a function of time. What is KZ as a function of time? Is the area of the remaining gradient, right? So the way to do it is actually to go from the end and then integrate this. Okay. So we start at the end. We always start at zero because after that, there is nothing. So the end is always kz equals zero. The end, not the beginning. In, in the reception, it was the beginning, kz equals zero, right? But now it's at the end. It's interesting, right? Okay. And then we integrate gz. So integrate gz, and this is kz as a function of time. Now, folks, I have to say, this is a, just a model, right? It's just a way to compute things. But there's also a nice interpretation of it, which looks, looks like a Fourier transform, which we'll be able to use when we want to do design, not just analysis. Okay. So um, how do we? So the first thing we do is we we plot kz as a function of time. So z, kz at the end is zero, and it's just linearly growing because it's just the area of this. Okay. So it starts from zero and goes to to be positive. Okay. Does that make sense? And then we map B1 onto the K. So now we know what K is. Then we start dropping B1 on this K. Okay? So the way to think about it, the way to think about it um, is actually the following. This is an axis, right? This is kz equals zero. This is also kz at time t. kz equals zero is kz at time t. At time t, kz equals zero, right? At this point, kz equals zero. Here, kz at time zero is positive. So we start here. We start at this point, somewhere in K, and what you can think of the RF, it's a truck that carries sand, and as you move in K, you are depositing RF, you're dropping sand, or you're dropping energy in K space. Okay? So our truck is gonna move from positive K all the way to K is equal zero, while dropping a sink of energy into K space, all right? So this is basically a sand truck that's depositing RF, or like it's an RF truck, the depositing RF as a function of Z, KZ. Do you see? This is what it does. So now I have the distribution of B1 of K. And remember that the MXY is the Fourier transform of B1 of K, or that, or that the W of K, right? But in this case, the gradient is constant, so dividing by the gradient doesn't really do anything. It just scales it, right? So that the, the shape stays the same. Okay? So the slice profile is the Fourier transform where this is the function. Now, what is the Fourier transform of this function? If this is a sink. What is it? Yo, what is it? It's erect. It's erect, almost. Well, the magnitude of the Fourier transform is erect. But notice that the sink is not centered around zero. 
the sink actually starts at zero and ends at some value of k. So it's shifted in k space. What does it mean on the frequency domain or the other domain, like the Fourier transform, or what is the effect on MXY? The fact that this is shifted. You're muted, but if, uh, if you don't want to be muted, you can just press on the unmute button. So what is the effect? Modulation. Phase. Modulation by a phase, like a complex exponential, like a linear phase, right? Mm -hmm. How much linear phase? Well, it depends how much it's shifted, right? Yeah, the linear phase is going to be exactly, you know, whatever this k divided by 2. You know, it's going to be proportional to it. Okay, so yes, B1 is not centered around K space. So the Fourier transform in magnitude is, the, is what we desire. The magnitude of the Fourier transform of this, or the magnitude of MXY, the magnitude looks like a rect. Okay. However, if I look at the real and imaginary component, it will have a linear phase. So it will have a real and imaginary component. You're going to get modulation. OK? Now, this is the slice direction. Remember, when we do slice selection, we encode the x, y, but the z direction is being integrated over. Right? It's integrated over. What happens when you integrate over this? Look at this positive position. It has a negative. Look at this positive. It has a negative. You know, all whatever is positive has a negative counterpart. So what happens when you integrate over that? You know what you get? Zero. you get a zero signal. That's a problem, right? Like we were able to excite our magnetization, but our magnetization has a linear phase across the slice. And that linear phase across the slice creates a correlation of the signal. That is a problem. You know how we fix it? Remember that blip that I told you about? That blip. The blip fixes it. Here, imagine this case. This is a situation where um, you know the area of this corresponds to half the area of this. Now it can be achieved in many ways. This could be, you know, uh, the same amplitude as this but half the, half the length, or it could be the same length and half the width, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so the area of this is half the area of this. So what's the first thing that we have to do is to map K to time. How do we map K to time? Well, we go to the end where K is equal zero, and now we integrate. So, uh, we integrate over here, and we uh, we get to this point. So this is negative. So this is kz being negative. And now this uh, this is positive. So when we reach the center, this is the same area. Uh, we're going at a faster slope a little bit. Uh, so when we go, uh, we keep on integrating, and then we get to kz equals zero at this point. Yes. And then we move forward, and then we get to Kz being positive. OK? So this is the mapping of Kz as a function of time. We have Kz as a function of time. Now we need to find, B, we, have, we know B1 as a function of time, but we need to know what B1 as a function of Kz. Right? So what is B1 as a function of Kz? We go and deposit RF, okay, in a truck. We start 
at kz being positive, we start here. This is kz at time zero. And then we start moving negative all the way to the negative kz. Positive kz to negative kz while depositing a sink. So we're going to move and deposit a sink all the way till we get here. Right? Okay. And we get here, right? To this point. Okay. But then we go and deposit zero. We don't deposit any RF now, but we still move in K. We still move in K. So we deposit nothing, but we move in K till we get to this point. Okay. And now this is Kz of T, which is also Kz of zero, because that's where we ended up. Okay, so now my situation is the following. If I want to know what the slice profile is, I'm going to compute the Fourier transform of this as a function of K. Now what is it? Now this is centered. It's centered around Kz equals zero. That blip over here, Move me such that we cross kz equals zero in the middle. You see how the sink is being dropped at kz equals zero because of this blip. Without this blip, it will be deposited up. But with this blip, oh, the truck is so cute. Oh, look at that. But without this, but with this blip, uh, we deposit the center and the at at k is equal to zero and looks like this. So the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform is going to be a centered sink and it's going to be a beautiful slice that we're going to integrate them. It's going to be just purely real or purely imaginary, depending on uh, which axis we excited. Does that make sense? I want to show you another way of looking at this. Instead of doing all this derivation, there's another way of, do, of, of going through the whole thing. If you get it, you get it. If you don't get it, you don't get it. Okay, but this is just another interpretation of exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, when you deposit RF, when you deposit RF, uh, what we can say is that at each time point that we deposit RF, it creates excitation. It's create a small MXY component. And what we can assume then that every small piece of time that the RF is being excited is going to create a small MXY. But because MZ, M, MZ doesn't change, then MXY has been recreated, 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 right? That's the assumption. So delta MXY as a function of T is I gamma B1 of T times delta T times M0. That's a small component that's being generated. Does that make sense? A small B1 field will create a small, um, a small excitation. Once this is excited, I'm gonna assume that it behaves separately. And so this, the spins that were excited at this position will only see the gradient that's remaining and process around it. In a crew phase, the spins created here are only going to see this gradient and they're going to accrue some phase depending on the gradient that's left. So spins that were excited here, right? Sorry, this spins over here did not see the gradient that was before. They only see the gradient that's left. So at each time point, new transverse magnetization is being created. And this new magnetization exhibits precession. So this one exhibits precession based on how much RF, uh, how much gradient is afterwards. Okay. All right. So effectively, um, how much RF is, uh, how much precession is the 
is proportional to the area of the gradient that's left. So I'm going to again define kz of t to be gamma over 2 pi, the integral from time t all the way to the end, gz of tau d tau. It's the area of the remaining gradient. That's how much fa it, that's the phase is going to be proportional to the area of the remaining gradient. This is another way of you know getting exactly the same thing. Now, magnetization at position z will process uh, through this angle, uh, minus two pi kz of t, right? Whatever kz is, it will process and basically have a rotation theta that is proportional to how much, what is kz. Okay, that's left. So magnetization that was excited at time t at position z will end up having a certain amount of phase. So this is magnetization at some position z at times t, and that's how much phase is going to uh, accrue. Okay, so each one of those small excitations creates spins with that phase. What is the total signal? The total signal is the integral over, over what? Over z, right? Of the entire, sorry, sorry uh, not z, integral over t, the entire time, right? Like for all these, all these excitations, I need to integrate over time. And so, each magnetization increment is dated, processed independently, and the result is the sum of all. So we need to sum the magnetization from time equals zero all the way to time t. So again, we integrate from zero to t and we get exactly the same expression. So that's just another way of getting to the same, the same thing. Again, if you didn't get it exactly, then you can just go over it. And if you have more questions, just go uh, in uh, office hours, and I'll be happy to explain. But basically, that's another way of thinking about what this approximation means. The fact that mz doesn't change means that mxy is just being created and independently processes. And uh, you don't touch that new mxy ever again. And you don't, and you just create new mz, uh, you mxy again and again every time you, you excite. And these just process independently. That's kind of the approximation. I'm John Pauly. Okay, so effectively, this is excitation k space. Like this derivation defines basically, you give me now an RF and you give me the gradient, I map, um, I map time to k space, and then I deposit, I deposit RF on this k space. And then my slice profile is the Fourier transform of that case space. Does that make sense? And that, that uh, all this was described in this paper uh, by John Pauly in 1989 as part of actually his PhD. And so um, a few years ago, I don't remember actually when, JMR, which is the Journal of Magnetic Resonance, uh, they did an interview with the authors of this paper because it's, pretty, it's a seminal paper that describes this notion that you can describe RF pulses as <coughs> being deposited in what we call excitation case space. Okay, and I'm just going to um, play you the interview. Uh, John Pauly, for those who don't know, is a professor at Stanford um, and was also my, my PhD advisor. And he did that during his PhD. So I'm John Pauly. I'm a professor of electrical engineering here at Stanford University. At the time this paper was written, I was a graduate student. This is the first paper I ever wrote. Alan Dwight wrote my advisors. Um, Al Makovsky, I'm a, right now a emeritus professor, and I've been at Stanford in, since like 1971. So I'm Dwight Nishimura, and I'm currently a professor of electroengineering at Stanford. I was um, an assistant professor uh, back at the time that John published his paper on the excitation case space approach to selective excitation. Well, uh, our group had been in angiography since way back. We had some very early grants from NIH on uh, 
coronary artery imaging and the carotid artery imaging, and that has continued to the present day. John was supposed to be working on angiography, and at, at that time, one of the methods he was working on was on a velocity selective excitation approach, uh, basically like a theta minus theta, a little um, flow encoding in between. And um, I'm actually not sure how. I'd be interested to hear John's story on how he actually came across this, but I know the concept of exciting in the presence of a time varying gradient was kind of an issue that would come up from time to time, and we really did not know how to deal with that. I was supposed to be working on angiography, not selective excitation. But angiography was frustrating. Selective excitation, on the other hand, just worked. All of my thesis ended up being about selective excitation. Peter Webb got me started on all of this. We were talking about Paul Bottomley's progress excitation pulses, and I told Peter that the problem with those pulses was that they just excited a single ring in spatial frequency, which you really wanted was something that covered more of spatial frequency, like a spiral. Peter didn't believe it was that simple, and the paper was a result of trying to show him that it really was. 2D pulses ended up being used for a number of applications, including coronary angiography and MR Doppler. So 2D pulses ended up benefiting angiography after all. Well, I'm, I'm Bob Poo. I'm one of the cardiologists. Um, I joined Dr. Makovsky's laboratory uh, back in the 1980s um, I, yeah, with the hope of uh, applying MRI technology to uh, cardiology. Uh, and at the time, we realized that there were several potential applications. Um, one was in the area of uh, angiography, where the um, where the pulse was used to uh, tag the blood in the root of the aorta to make them visible on coronary artery imaging. The second um, uh, major application we found at the time was its use in being able to limit the excitation of blood uh, to just the aorta and thereby uh, significantly accelerating our uh, acquisition uh, uh, in the measurement of blood flow velocities. Mm -hmm. The paper is also responsible for me meeting my future wife, Kim Butts. She was a graduate student at Mayo at the time and wanted to use 2D pulses for real-time velocity imaging. Hi, my name is Kim butts Polly, and I'm a professor of radiology at Stanford University. Back around 1991, I was a graduate student at the Mayo Clinic working with Steve Reeder, uh, working on a method for rapid uh, velocity imaging with 2D excitation pulses. Um, this was kind of analogous to ultrasounds, uh, M-mode and B-mode ultrasounds. So I was studying John's excitation case space paper pretty carefully when I happened to be getting coffee next to him at a conference. And when I looked down and I saw his name on his name tag, I said, oh, you're the one who wrote that really great paper. And I was a little embarrassed that I sort of blurted that out, so I tried to cover it up and say, oh, but people probably tell you that all the time. And John said, no, they don't. So anyway, um, we used to, um, after that, we met at all the conferences, and I used to make a point of going to see whatever John was working on. So the Journal of Magnetic Resonance and this paper have had a major effect on my life in many different ways. Anyway, I thought it was cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, so effectively, um, this, this is a very powerful way to analyze RF pulses because once you understand that RF pulses are indeed depositing energy in K space and then just computing the Fourier transform, I mean, then it just comes down to filter design, like just designing what would be, um, you know, pick a gradient and then, you know, that gradient defines K space and then go and deposit, uh, deposit RF that would, uh, that such that this Fourier transform will result in the slice profile that you'd like. I mean, this is pretty remarkable it makes the design also of RF pulses extremely, extremely simple for small flip angle, right? Like we're only talking about small flip angle right now. So um, when, yeah. So when you say it burns or it deposits, is that all because W of K is equal to gamma B1 over the magnitude of the gradient? Yeah. So That's where right. does that come from? Do you believe that? Like it just sort of popped out. Oh, it's just when you change variables, that's what comes up. Does it? If Are you, you sure? change variables from T to yeah, if you change variables from T to K, 
instead of integrating over t, you integrate over k. Then you have to uh, basically, you know, divide like uh, divide by the Jacobian, uh, multiply by the Jacobian, and that that's where it comes down by change of variables. And that was in his paper, and that's from that change of variables, yeah. you you get this idea that it burns or it's a weighting. That's right. It's it's uh, I mean, if again, like uh, you know, what, well, it comes down to be b one of k, all right? Like if just imagine. I mean, what we're doing right now when we did this analysis is we first find what k is what is k of t, right? And then we took b1 and we mapped it to k, right? We know what b1 of t, we know what k of t is. Now we can map b1 to k. Does that does that make sense? I'll show you where. But there's the, also a, but there is also a g in there. B of k is dependent yeah, on g. So I'll, right? I'll tell you. Right, so you think of it if you have if you have a higher like a faster gradient, then when you deposit, like if you deposit exactly the same amount of b one, and if you go faster, because g is, is larger, then you're actually depositing fewer like, like less rf at a particular position. You're just spreading that rf over a much larger space. Is it is there sense? an assumption buried in there that g is constant. No. It could be any weird g. No, there isn't. There isn't. It's g of t. That's why it comes up. Let, let me just go over and through examples, you you can see how it comes down to. But again, the algorithm of like to derive things. First of all, find what is k. Uh, k of t. You know what b one of t. So now you map b one to k. And once you map b one to k, then you're done. You just take a Fourier transform of that result. Now the mapping of B1 to K um, has a dependency on G, of course, like where you are and that kind of stuff. So let me just go over that in a second. I'll give you some examples and you see what's, what's the difference, okay? Um, okay, so let's assume that we have a uniform object, a uniform object, which is just direct, okay? It's an object, which is uniform. Now let's apply um, a sync pulse in the present of GZ Okay, and see what happens. Well, what happens is um, let's map, first of all, what is um, kz as a function of z? Uh, sorry, as a function of time. What is kz as a function of time? Okay, what is kz? Kz um, starts at zero. Remember, it goes negative, right? It goes negative and then it goes positive, right? And this is t equals zero. This is t equals t, okay? All right, so that's great. So now, This is kz, and we're going to deposit the rf, right? Let's deposit the rf. We start at positive kz in the beginning, positive kz. So we start here, and then we start moving constantly, right? Moving, uh, moving constantly in the negative direction while depositing a sink with a constant gradient, with a constant velocity. Yes? We go from kz being positive to kz being negative. So we're going from here to here and we're going to deposit a sink. So I'm going to start here and I'm going to deposit the sink. Now I got to this time. Yeah. This time point corresponds to this time point. Okay. Oh, actually, yeah. Um, yeah. Hold on. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me just. Uh, Oh, I, oh! Actually, I made a I made a animation of this. Sorry. Well, what am I doing? Hold on. 
let me let me restart it. Okay, so uh, what have I done is uh, this is KZ, and I'm going to deposit an RF on this KZ. Okay, and so the way it works is you know you move and deposit RF, and then you get to this point, right? Now this is KZ equals zero, right? When you reach here, this is the time t. That's KZ equals zero. Because the time t, you know, it's just, uh, yeah. So this, this is where we ended up, right? Like we just deposited the RF. And now this is negative. So we start moving in the other direction, right? So this is negative. We're starting to move in the other direction. So the RF deposited the sink into this uniform object. Now, what is the Fourier transform of a sink? Uh, of a rect? Is a sink, right? So in reception, if we have a rect object, we should read out a sink. And as we now move in case space, remember, in, in case space, we move now to the other way. But when we move the other way, we're also, if we turn on the A to D, we'll also receive a sync. The signal that we receive is the Fourier transform of our object. So if we have a uniform object, when we excite it, when we excite it, we deposit the sync in RF. And then during the readout, we read it back. If our object was uniform, does that make sense? And this is just a, it's just a beautiful, um, you know, um, beautiful comp co the complementary of excitation, which you deposit energy in k-space, and in the readout, during the readout part, you read that energy from k-space. Okay, so this they they, they go along. Uh, with each other. So you deposit a sink, and now our signal is supposed to be a sink, so you read it out. Okay? And of course, if you remember, if this is half the area of this one, right, at this time point over here, at this time point over here, that's usually where we end up our pulse, right? And then if we apply a Z gradient, we'll actually get half a sink come out. You know, because we read, now we're, now we're in readout case space. I don't know if that makes, makes sense, but that's, that's kind of like the nice analogy between them. Okay, so now I wanted to show you some uh, simulations. Um, so this is a, uh, a simulation of a small flip angle. Um, this is the pulse sequence. We apply a very small sync RF. You can barely see it, but it's like very small. It's five degrees or 10 degrees. And then I apply this GZ and then a refocusing. And now I'm going to play you what is MX, MX, MY, and MZ or the magnitude of MXY in its phase. And look what's happening. Wait. So uh, let me actually switch to uh, a different view um, to actually the simulation. New share, spin bench. Spin bench is a, is a um, basically it's a, uh, it's a block simulation a tool, but also a pulse sequence design tool. And basically you can uh, kind of simulate everything kind of on the fly. So um, here's kind of what happens uh, to the spins as we apply the RF pulse. So in the beginning, there's no RF, right? So nothing happens, okay? And then now we start depositing RF. 
And as we deposit RF, you see that MY component starts starts doing something? It's because we're applying MX. And so something is happening in the MXY direction. Spins are being created, like excited. So MXY magnetization is being excited. And that's where it's done. Okay, that's before the blip. Before the blip, the distribution of MX as a function of Z is oscillatory. As a function of Y, it's oscillatory. So if you sum over it, the sum of it will be zero, right? The magnitude though, look at it, it's beautiful. This is a five, five millimeter uh, uh, slice. So like it goes from two, uh, minus 2.5 to 2.5, you know, being excited. Um, and so you can kind of see, oh, the magnitude is right, but it has a linear phase. So the MXY component looks like this. And as I have now the negative lobe, as I now let spins persist, now they untangle this linear phase. And at the end of the pulse over here, now the phase is constant. It's the same phase across the entire slice. And all the magnetization is in the y direction as opposed to being in the mx y. And I've got this beautiful uh, slice being excited. Does that make sense? Now, this Good is question. a small flip angle. Which yeah. Mx and my by themselves, are they complex or are you plotting the real parts or what? No, mx y is complex. mx y is a complex. Yeah, mx. But is the real part and MY is the imaginary part. Yeah, okay. So what happens if I apply instead of a, um, instead of 10 degrees, I apply 45 degrees. So first of all, the MXY component grows and let's get to 45 degrees. So, First of all, something happens here. The MZ component now is non-zero, is not one. You see that now when it's 45 degrees, I'm starting to have MZ not being zero. But for a small flip angle, let's say 10 degrees uh, or five degrees, basically MZ is really constant, right? MZ is constant, it's just the MY is created. But when the flip angle is large, let's say 45 degrees, then that, that assumption is violated. And you start seeing also some MXY component, even though it's not supposed to be there, according to the Fourier thing. And as I increase it to 90 degrees, you know, you still get the pretty good excitation, but now I get another MX component, you know? So there is some MX component that's gonna cancel, its contribution is gonna cancel but it's not exactly a Fourier transform anymore. And of course the MZ component, you know, goes all the way to, z you know, to zero over there. So you start seeing the effect of nonlinearity. And the effect of nonlinearity, of course, becomes like the worst as you go to 180 degrees, where you start having a lot of other components. Okay, so things then go haywire, are not behavior, uh, behaving exactly as you would like. Okay, so now I wanna do this uh, very small exercise uh, with you together, okay? And the situation is the following. I have, and then, and then we're gonna finish. I have a gradient depositing a sink, and then I have a gradient with double, double the amplitude, has exactly the same area, but double the amplitude and depositing a sink with exactly the same amplitude, but this time it shrink because you know, we want to fit it. Okay. So what do you think this is going to do? What is KZ? KZ is we need to, you know, we need to, uh, you know, it's negative and then positive, right? 
So it's negative with a very fast slope. And then positive, and this area is exactly the same as this area, so it goes to kz equals zero, like this, right? Okay, so effectively now we mapped B1, we, not, we mapped kz to time. We now know what B1 as time is, and now we need to deposit it in k space, okay? So let's go and deposit this B1 into k space. So I go and I deposit it, you know, in this direction, right? So then I deposit and this is what I get, okay? Now what happens when we go from here to here? You go in the opposite direction and you deposit again the same thing, right? But now the B1 is negative. So we deposit a sink in the negative. But what is, but here's the, here's the situation. We're going twice as fast, right? We're going twice as fast. And this is exactly the same amplitude. So when we go back, we have to divide by G. Remember that W needs to be divided by G? So the amount of B1 that when we go back is actually half the amplitude. When we go back, the B1 is actually half the amplitude. And so when you add these together, they don't cancel completely. And if this one will result in theta flip angle in the pass band, the result of this entire pulse will be theta over two. Does that make sense? Because the other part cancels some of that. Flips, spins back to their position. Now, how do we know that this is the case? Well, we can always calculate, remember, what is the, what is the excitation that happens in the center of the magnet? The center of the magnet doesn't see the gradients, right? So it's just the integral of this thing. Obviously, the integral of this thing is not zero, right? The integral of this thing is basically half the integral of this, right? Because the integral of this is half the integral of that. So, you know, they cancel. Does that make sense? In order to really cancel, then I should have doubled, doubled the amplitude. And then I would deposit exactly the same. Does that more make sense now with the G, Anita? That's kind of how the G appears, is if the gradient is different amplitude, then you need to scale the B1 based on that. Because you're effectively dropping the same RF, but going faster so it uh, spreads out. So to, at every position, it's not, the, it's not the same amount. So this is what happens. And then the contribution of it is going to be this excitation. And then the Fourier transform of that is of course, what's the Fourier transform of that? Well, the magnitude is going to be It's gonna be like this, but because, but because this is zero, then it's gonna have a linear phase across it. Okay? Because this is kz equals zero. Sorry, this is kz equals zero. Anyway, it's not, it's not centered. It's not centered. You know what, let's do a quick one. Also. Let's do a quick one and then maybe we'll answer. Let's do this one. What is KZ? You go and integrate and then you go like this and then you go like this. Yeah? So we start at KZ equals zero. We go positive. We go negative all the way to the other side and then we go positive again, 
right? So we start at k is equal zero. Let's say this is k is equal zero. Okay, and then we go positive, right? We go positive and what RF we deposit? No RF. Okay, we go here, it doesn't deposit any RF, but we're here at this point. Okay, now this point is where we are. And now we're going negative all the way while depositing a sink. And then the last part is we go back to zero, right? So we go back to zero. And now this is also Kz of T equals zero. So now this is our RF as a function of K. What's the Fourier transform? Erect, right? Okay, so what did this gradient do? Did it do anything? No, I could have have it, I could not have it, it doesn't matter. We would always start depositing RF at positive KZ, no matter what, whether this existed or not. Okay, because a gradient before the RF makes no sense. It doesn't do anything. And you can see that it doesn't do anything also. You just move here and deposit nothing. Okay, so um, I think we'll finish now. I'll stay five more minutes to answer questions. Uh, we're gonna have more examples like this next time. We're gonna go over many, many examples on Thursday. Uh, and then we're, uh, we're going to try to finish chapter f uh, six completely on Thursday. All right. Now you know excitation case space. So extremely powerful. We're going to talk then about design, how now we go and do design. All right. Any questions, Anita? Previous slide at the bottom, it said KZ of T, KZ of capital T on the 